I'm pleased to open the high level security council area formula meeting organized by Niger and co-hosted by the permanent missions of Belgium, China, Dominican Republic, Estonia, France, Germany, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and South Africa. The theme of today's area formula meeting is access to education in conflict and post-conflict context, role of digital technology and connectivity. As you know, access to connectivity and digital technology is an essential tool for learning. It is presidential, in its presidential statements, PRST 2020-8, which focuses on attacks on schools, the Security Council has emphasized the need for member states to facilitate continuation of education during armed conflict, including through distance learning and digital technology. The aim of today's meeting is to share lessons learned and best practices in relation to expanding connectivity to children in conflict and post-conflict and post-disaster situation and to discuss how the Security Council and the UN system can support the implementation of the resolutions aimed at expanding access to education to children in conflict and post-conflict situation and affected by all the major shocks. I will now give the, the floor to Madame Arietta Faure, the Executive Director of UNICEF. Madame Faure, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, uh, Ambassador. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you this morning. On behalf of everyone at UNICEF, thank you for this opportunity to talk about the importance of universal connectivity and digital tools and with our appreciation to you, the permanent mission of Niger for the invitation. As I speak, half of humanity is not connected to the internet, including 360 million children and young people. For these young people, the costs are high. It means losing out on learning and education. It means not gaining skills that they need to find employment. And in the broadest terms, it means perpetuating the inequalities that continue to divide communities and the world between the haves and the have-nots, between those who have access to opportunities and those who do not. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed this divide in very stark terms. It caused the largest disruption of education in history, affecting 1.6 billion learners across more than 190 countries. This is especially tragic in low and middle income countries, places where gaining an education is already an uphill battle. And especially so in countries enduring conflict and instability. In all, nearly one in every four children in the world lives in conflict or disaster stricken countries. And that means that more than 75 million children and young people are currently in urgent need of educational support in 35 crisis affected countries. Girls in conflict zones are especially at risk. They already face a range of challenges, including violence and abuse and psychological trauma. They're also less likely than boys to return to school following lockdowns and the destruction of school infrastructure. The figures are also stark for refugees. Even before COVID, only half of the refugee children have access to primary education compared to the global level of more than 90%. For adolescent refugees, the picture is bleaker still. Just over one fifth of them were in uh, lower secondary school, and just 1% of the refugees attended university, compared to a global rate of 34%. In short, we are failing a generation of young learners across conflict and post-conflict settings, not only denying them an opportunity to shape their minds and pursue opportunities, 
but a sense of normalcy, of safety, of growth that every child needs. At UNICEF, we believe that as countries look to build peace, grow economies, and climb the development ladder, they must dramatically expand education for all people, no matter who they are and where they live. So closing the digital gap is a critical step. UNICEF and ITU have joined forces to launch GIGA, an ambitious global initiative to connect every school and its surrounding community to the internet. And partners are rapidly joining our work. More than 30 member states are now mapping out school connectivity. They're also working through GIGA to create investment opportunities for blended public and private sector money to build infrastructure needed to provide universal access to the internet. Working with my fellow and sister co-briefers today, um, Minister Senge, Minister Gimba, Minister Ingabeiri, we are developing business cases to connect almost 33,000 schools in total across Sierra Leone, Niger, and Rwanda. We've also joined forces to create locally developed technology, grassroots innovations, that UNICEF can help to take to scale. In Sierra Leone, for example, we've been working with Minister Senge to build drone corridors, test cryptocurrency for public services, and use sophisticated satellite data to map the most vulnerable populations and their schools. All of these innovations review expanding connectivity to every community. And the government of Rwanda has developed one of the most comprehensive child safety online frameworks anywhere to keep children safe when using these tools. And we encourage other countries to follow this model. So government commitment is essential, but we also need other partners to join our work. Ericsson has joined GIGA with a multi-year, multi-million dollar commitment. The European Investment Bank is now supporting our work to create financing solutions like connectivity bonds for internet access in vulnerable countries. The World Bank has provided our host, Niger, with 100 million US dollars to connect schools and villages, an exciting opportunity that UNICEF is proud to support. UNICEF is also working with UNHCR to increase school connectivity in communities that are hosting refugees, while also designating and designing, activating the tools that young refugees need to continue their own education. This includes online learning tools like the Learning Passport, a distance learning pass platform that we have developed with Microsoft and Cambridge University. We're working with mobile phone companies, providing zero rating solutions to provide access to online learning tools as we've done in Africa and Latin America. And this means affordable or zero costs for downloading educational data. We have also joined forces with companies to provide students with new learning devices that are preloaded to relevant topical and accessible curriculum. Our ultimate vision is about taking all of these tools, this software that the serves the public needs and combining it with safe universal connectivity. We want to revolutionize learning and skills for children, no matter where they live, by turning them into digital public goods. Imagine being a young person and connecting to the internet for the first time. Imagine feeling that the internet is safe for you. Imagine finding at your fingertips all the tools you need to learn, build skills, find employment, and communicate globally, all for free as globally available digital public goods. To bring this vision to life, <clears throat> we have launched the Digital Public Goods Alliance with Norway, Sierra Leone, and India's iSpirit. This alliance brings together open source solutions that can support young people across every aspect of their lives. As I've explained, education is a big part of this, but connectivity and digital goods can support so much more 
for conflict and post-conflict settings. They can become a permanent part of a country's infrastructure as they rebuild following a humanitarian emergency like a conflict or a natural disaster. This includes providing training and skills development for young people ready to join the workforce and especially girls. Our Generation Unlimited platform is bringing together the public and private sectors to develop and deploy new digital tools and investments to this work. We want to modernize education for this century. And just last week, UNICEF connected the Norwegian Digital Public Goods Alliance to GIGA. We're now working with the ministers here today and their teams and many others to develop and deploy open source software for financial inclusion, health, education, and more. Software that can be shared across participating GIGA countries. But unlocking these opportunities requires a massive global effort. We need all countries to join early leaders like Niger, Sierra Leone, Kazakhstan, Rwanda, on both connectivity and developing and scaling the digital software that can deliver solutions across a range of sectors. We need to reach the most marginalized children and communities by pooling together the data that we as governments, as UN agencies, as civil society have to identify the gaps, especially in conflict affected areas and for those children on the move, such as migrants and refugees and IDPs. So in conclusion, and as always, we need funding. Join our call to raise an initial 3 billion US dollars in catalytic funding for connectivity and 500 million US dollars for digital learning including content for every child under UNICEF's Reimagine Education initiative. We need your help and influence. More than anyone, this council recognizes the clear link between a child's ability to learn and grow and the peaceful, prosperous, and stable world that we all see. Help us to unlock the full promise of connectivity and digital tools not only for children and young people, but for their communities and their countries, and ultimately for the peace of the world. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Madam Four, I thank you for your briefing. I now give the floor to ASG Dorin. ASG, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council, Excellencies, my fellow co-briefers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. ITU is honored to be invited by the permanent mission of Niger to support today's meeting and to join this important dialogue on universal connectivity and access to digital technology for children in conflict and post-conflict contexts. I congratulate the Council on reaffirming its commitment to the right of every child to quality education in a peaceful and secure environment. ITU is the UN Specialized Agency for Digital Technologies, and I serve in one of the agency's five elected posts, leading our development work. The COVID pandemic has underscored the vital importance of an internet connection. The effect of school closures has been most catastrophic for children in the world's poorest countries, for displaced children, and children living in zones affected by conflict and violence. Tragically for some, that lost learning will have a long-term impact on their future prospects. Children displaced by conflict or living in conflict zones face serious barriers to life-changing educational opportunities. Local schools may have been destroyed. Classrooms may no longer be safe spaces. These children are at increased risks of violence, sexual abuse, exploitation, and forced labor, as UNICEF ED just mentioned. Digital connectivity offers a powerful way to reach these children, to reach them via portable devices like mobile phones and tablets, so that they can continue their education even if traditional learning environments are no longer accessible. 
The technologies to do this exist today, but the mechanisms to put them at the hands of the children who need them most do not. The first mobile device created to educate children in developing world contexts was launched by the former Secretary General Kofi Annan at the World Summit for the Information Society in 2005. Since then, innovation has flourished. Technology is not what is holding us back. The real impediments are a lack of network infrastructure, a lack of enabling policy frameworks, affordable services, digital skills, and above all, and I stress above all, a lack of political commitment to change that picture. The late great Nelson Mandela observed that education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. The GIGA partnership between ITU, UNICEF and others seeks to put that power within the reach of all. Our goal is simple. We want to connect every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity and choice. Our multi-stakeholder approach is based around the, the, the establishment of an initial $3 billion pooled fund, much like the Gavi Global Vaccine Alliance. This catalytic seed funding will set the ball rolling towards the $428 billion that ITU estimates will initially be needed to connect the remaining half of the world to broadband by 2030, as well as the $46 billion UNICEF education estimates will be required under the Reimagine Education Initiative. GIGA strives to create business, financial, and partnership models with governments, the private sector, and civil society using schools as a demand aggregation point, an aggregation point that would drive the digital empowerment of entire communities. As Henrietta mentioned, we've already mapped 800,000 schools in 30 countries focusing our initial efforts in Central Asia, Eastern Caribbean, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Progress on partnership building has also been rapid. We're working, as you've heard, with Niger, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, and we were thrilled to have Ericsson join us as the first company to make that multi-million dollar, multi-year commitment to GIGA. We're also working with SoftBank Investment Advisors, who's created GIGA's first financial model for private sector investment. The European Investment Bank has committed to help identify financing solutions and as well the Digital Public Goods Alliance supported by Norway that will help us ensure that this relevant content can be shared across participating countries. And of course, we're integrating GIGA into our Smart Village project with Niger. Connecting the second half of the planet and providing all children with online access requires fresh approaches to old problems. By matching mobile technologies with online learning, GIGA will support the empowerment of learners, not just in classrooms, but wherever they may find themselves. The impact this could have in bringing the transformational power of education to children impacted by conflict and displacement is quite simply unprecedented. Let me stress one more issue before I close. In line with UNSG's roadmap and the three principles of connect, respect, and protect, we recognize that children are vulnerable and that efforts to connect them must always en encompass efforts to protect them from online harms. For over a decade, ITU's online, Child Online Protection Initiative has brought together government industry and education professionals to develop guidelines for safe access. And we will expand work in this area as GIGA ramps up. Distinguished counselors, COVID has taken away a great deal, but it has also brought us undivided attention of global leaders around digital connectivity. The GIGA vision offers a once in a lifetime, once in a generation chance to make real and rapid strides forward in empowering the youngest members of our, of our communities to transform their lives. We cannot and we must not miss our chance. I thank you very much for your attention. ASG Dorin, thank you for your briefing. I now invite Mr. Ibrahim Gimba Seidu, Minister of State and Chief Executive Officer 
of the National Agency for Information System and Technology of Niger to take the floor. Minister Gimba, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Excellencies, distinguished participants, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak before this very distinguished assembly. The probability of winning the jackpots is one over 175 million. That is actually what moral, that is more or less the perception that the youth have in when looking at their future. They only see obstacles. They see lack of opportunities. They believe that they need to win the jackpot in order for them to succeed in life. So you can imagine the challenge before us, a country like Niger, the youngest on earth, and with one of the fastest growing population. Imagine that if our youth believe that the only way for them to succeed in life is by winning lottery. You can clearly see the impact it could have on peace and security. You can clearly see the impact it could have on development at large. That is why the government of Niger, under the leadership of President Mohamed Yusufu, has decided to accelerate in its investment on its most important resource, human capital, and more particularly on its youth, as I indicated before, being the youngest country on earth, make us potentially one of the richest. So Niger has decided, as I indicated before, to focus now more than before on education. And in order to achieve that in a country as big, with, a, with one of the largest sorry, um, area on the continent, almost 1.3 million square, meter, uh, square kilometers, and with only six to 7% of the population living in a capital city, we face a huge challenge. That is why we have also in the meantime decided to leverage what technology can bring us. We decided to leverage technology to enable access to good education to all, everywhere and anywhere. President Isufu has reinstated that on his brief on September 10th, when he emphasized on the right to education and its contribution to achieve peace and security, and more importantly, on the commitment of the government of Niger to increase resources towards education. Under his leadership, we have developed the Niger 2.0, 2.0 plan, which is the framework that we have developed a multi, uh, sorry, a multi stakeholders approach to really address the key development challenges that we have. Niger 2.0 focuses primarily one on citizens and two on service delivery. It is almost solely based on knowledge acquisition and access to information. It is a way for us to connect the unconnected. It is also a way for us to bring some balance in the distribution of wealth on the country. It is also through Niger 2.0, particularly in two of its dimensions, one that was, indicated, that was mentioned before, the Smart Village Program, which is going to help us connect 
over 92% of the territory. It is a very ambitious plan, but it's a plan that for us is a must. It's a plan that the government is committed to achieving. Through this plan, not only can we connect and connect it, but we can also connect the displaced population. Niger is facing displaced population in the conflict around, uh, sorry, in many of its borders due to conflicts in our neighboring countries. Whether it's in the Black Chad area or in the Mali, along the Mali borders, we have thousands of young boys and girls displaced who lack proper infrastructure to continue their education. That's what the Smart Village is going to help us address. That's also what the GIGA initiative is going to help us achieve in the most comprehensive way. Although we are focusing on education and connecting schools, we recognize that actually it is communities that we are enabling. Through the partnership with GIGA, in the implementation of Smart Village, will be unleashing the potential that each and every village or communities of Niger will be able to bring to the table. In fact, the school is just going to be the meeting point of the village, as through the connectivity, hospitals or local clinics are going to be connected, administration are going to be connected, and marketplaces are going to be connected. That's what is going to bring the utmost value, not only for the population, but for peace and security also. I would like to invite you in my closing remarks to join us in making this a reality. Pilots are already up and running. We have few that we have started with the ITU and all the UN agencies. We are going to accelerate those by a couple of dozens in the next few months. And more importantly, we are going to leverage the experience for those pilots in the implementation of the program for which we just got about $100 million from the World Bank. Of course, this is a very good beginning, but we need much more resources and time is of essence. We have done our part with the ITU, with the UN agencies, UNICEF in particular, and now with the GIGA community by also presenting a blueprint for Smart Village, which shows the way to optimizing the resources that you'll be able to bring to the table. And that also give up a map, a roadmap to achieving the SDGs and to addressing peace and security challenges in the region. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I look forward to working with all of you in the near future. Thank you. I thank you, Minister Gimba, for your briefing. I now give the floor to Madame Paula Ingabire, Minister of Information and Communications, Technology and Innovation of Rwanda. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Excellency, Ministers, UNICEF Executive Director, ITU Director for Development Bureau, Doreen, and um, dear participants. Uh, it's an honor for me to join the discussions this afternoon uh, that seek to share our experiences um, in leveraging technology and connectivity towards increasing access to quality education. Something I believe is, a, and we all believe is a basic right uh, to mankind. More so, 
I'm excited to be part uh, of such a forum that I believe will collectively and innovatively find solutions to this same challenge that we all face. And when I say all of us, it's from the low to high income countries that in many ways have pockets of communities that still experience uh, the digital divide. Rwanda, just like many countries, has put in place uh, deliberate efforts as part of our national strategy for transformation to develop uh, Rwandans into capable and skilled people with quality standards of living and a stable, uh, while offering them a stable and secure society. And this can only be done if we're ensuring quality uh, education for all. And um, to echo what uh, uh, Enrietta said earlier around uh, the work that is being done on, uh, you know, providing equal opportunities to refugees, to children in conflict areas, as part of our government policy, we have integrated uh, these children, especially refugees, into the education system without differentiating them. And so they have equal access to these uh, education opportunities that we offer our very own uh, kids here. Um, to achieve uh, this ambitious goal um, of really uh, improving the quality of standards of living, of having a capable and skilled workforce, without a doubt, we know that leveraging digital technologies has and will continue to play a pivotal role in our development strategy. Where mainstreaming ICT in key sectors of our economy, including education, uh, will continue to enable increased adoption um, of technology. Our bundled strategy focuses on rolling out school connectivity solutions, deploying two classrooms uh, per school, and these classrooms are fitted with uh, laptops and smart boards, uh, but also digitizing content. However, even with these investments that we've been making as a government, uh, the gaps are still, still remain with only about 52 uh, percent of our secondary schools and 30 percent of our primary schools, um, you know, connected to the internet. And so we must and will continue to drive the necessary investments to bridge this gap. Rwanda is a co-chair of the UN uh, Broadband Commission, as well as a country lead for the GIGA initiative, fully supports this uh, initiative to connect all schools by 2030. And GIGA has its unique approach in how uh, we are tackling the school connectivity agenda. It's very holistic um, uh, to school connectivity beyond infrastructure, but more importantly, um, looking at aspects around sufficient and reliable um, affordable bandwidth, but also catering for other um, aspects such as relevant content, digital skills, and empowering communities to be part of finding uh, solutions. We believe that such an approach will greatly address the key challenges of access, quality, equity, relevance, and management. Globally, the education uh, system has been affected and dis disrupted heavily by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we all, the previous speakers did allude to that as well. Um, and, and for many governments as a mechanism of prevention, uh, schools have been closed. And this has led to unprecedented demand uh, for digital learning solutions something I believe uh, should be the norm uh, with or without a crisis. Digital learning and teaching methods must be a complementary method to our traditional models of learning and teaching. And this should be able to support uh, outside the classroom learning as well as lifelong uh, learning. In response to the disruption caused by this pandemic, um, just like many governments, Rwanda has been able to zero rate uh, education platforms. And this wouldn't have been possible without the partnerships and willingness to find solutions from the private sector. We've been able to think about, ex we've, we've been able to extend learning, um, you know, opportunities and programs through TV and radio, even, the, even in as much as they may not be effective, but at least uh, we're able to offer something that um, allows the different students, the different children that still live uh, you know, in communities that are unconnected to at least have a bit of exposure to some educational programs. The demand uh, for adaptive edutech solutions to keep our young people engaged uh, both positively and progressively contributes to the development of new ways of teaching. And we recognize that more than ever, it should be a priority to make digital learning content and connectivity 
accessible to every young person. Something I wanted to share uh, this afternoon is that we have a more pressing priority. Uh, and this is really around how do we equip our teachers to adequately take advantage of this infrastructure and digital tools that we're putting uh, to the disposal of our students. Uh, our teachers are central to improving learning outcomes and must be prioritized in this whole process. Uh, this has been um, what I can say, uh, you know, something that we've learned as a country in our journey of digitizing of the education system and realizing that if we don't start with the teachers, then halfway through the process, there's something that we've missed and we're not able to, uh, you know, cash in on the, you know, the much anticipated impact that we're looking for as we make such investments. So connecting schools therefore presents us with this unique opportunity as we set up schools as epicenters that support the vibrant development of communities, but also thinking as to, uh, uh, you know, about the teachers as our immediate priority to skill and, uh, and afford the ability to own and use these tools so that they can reach out and impart the required uh, 21st century skills to our children. That said, 2030 isn't far away. And I think the key thing for us to do is to start now with whatever resources are available. Through the UNICEF and IT support, we've mapped over 4,000 schools, analyzing existing policies and regulations that are central to advancing uh, the school connectivity agenda. And as we develop the affordable and sustainable financial models to really connect all the unconnected schools, we intend to start by connecting the first 1,000 schools by June 2021. And so I think this is something that we can all be very deliberate about in terms of not waiting for all the resources to be available, but really starting with what we have. Doreen, uh, just to echo uh, what you said earlier, technology isn't what is really holding us back. Uh, and, and, and I like that you looked at that holistic enabling framework, which is really not just infrastructure access, but looking at content and devices, uh, looking at skills, looking at the necessary policy and regulatory environment that fosters both investment and innovation of affordable solutions uh, for schools. So as we build these financial models for digital connectivity infrastructure, uh, I wanted to share some of the other things that I feel uh, for, country, for low to middle income countries that uh, we may be looking at and must be a prerequisite to rolling out this infrastructure, such as electricity infrastructure. With the competing priorities we have for financing, we must be smart in how we make our investments. Combining the efforts, the investments for rolling out electricity to rural communities with uh, the, the investments that are required to put in place the necessary connectivity infrastructure. You will not be able, you know, you know, pulling fiber to a school and they don't have electricity will not serve us any good. And so finding that coordinated approach and, and, and a smart approach towards how we make our investments in a much sustainable manner is, is essential. Lastly, um, I wanted to also draw attention to an area that I think deserves special attention. And I think this needs to be given to school going children with disabilities. You will agree with me that they experience a double divide. And so there must be a priority in everything that we're thinking about to also think about the kind of content, the kind of devices that is going to be required for them to not be left behind. Um, Minister Ibrahima, to echo your sentiments, uh, let's take on this ambitious plan. Let's make it a reality. It's a must, it's doable, and we must start now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister Ingabire, for your briefing. I will now give the floor to the co-host. The first speaker on this list is uh, Mr. Philip, the permanent representative of Belgium. Philippe, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, President Abari. Excellencies and dear colleagues, allow me to thank the speakers for their inspiring presentations and congratulate UNICEF and ITU for the GIGA partnership. I also thank Niger for its initiative in bringing the situation of children affected by armed conflict in the broad sense <coughs> to the attention of the Security Council. In line with the contributions of our briefers today, and I want here to underline the importance for all of us in the Security Council to listen today to two African ministers, one from Rwanda and one from Niger. 
in line with their contributions also from UNICEF and ITU, I would like to make three points. The first is about the relevance of connectivity for children affected by armed conflict. The second is about the importance of teacher training in this respect. And the third one is about the role of Belgium as we are just exchanging about experience. First, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to school closures around the world, but it has also demonstrated the importance of connectivity and access to education for children affected by armed conflict. We have heard UNICEF Executive Director and the ESG from ITU in this regard. Access to education in conflict contexts gives children a sense of normalcy and safe spaces where they can continue to learn. This is particularly relevant for girls, colleagues, who face higher risks of not attending school and not resuming their education following school closures. That is why this Council, underlined in the presidential statement on attacks on schools adopted last month under the leadership of Niger, once again, the need for member states to facilitate continuing education during armed conflict, including through distance learning and digital technologies, our topic today. But infrastructure and connectivity alone are not sufficient. And my second point concerns the importance of the proper use of technology. It is important to ensure not only access to materials and new technologies, but also that teachers are trained to use them. Often the distance education solutions that are implemented are not computer-based solutions, but distance courses via radio, television, or the printing of additional textbooks for the simple reason of lack of access to electricity or insufficient internet coverage. Together with our partners from the European Union, Belgium supports programs that promote access to education in conflict and post-conflict countries. We attach great importance to innovation and digital, digitalization for humanitarian and development work. In 2017, our development cooperation launched its Digital for Development strategy to harness the potential of dig digital technology for development. The aim is to connect the different actors on the ground to promote the exchange of knowledge and to foster innovative partnerships in support of the Sustainable Development Goals. The approach is guided by the two overarching principles of putting people first and do not harm. We are pleased to be contributors to UNICEF and the Global Partnership for Education. The Belgian Development Agency, ENABEL, trains educational personnel across Africa, often using distance learning modules. We also work with NGOs, for example, in Burkina Faso, where Belgium supports braille printers that digitalize homework, transposing it into braille so that visually impaired children are included. Alongside public sector agencies, the private sector plays also a key role in expanding opportunities and access to education. Connectivity can improve access to schooling in conflict areas, but states must also guarantee children's rights to education, even in the most difficult circumstances. And we have listened to the Rwandan and the Nigerian, uh, Nigerian minister this morning. We call on all states to ratify the optional protocol to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, on the involvement of children in armed conflict, the Safe Schools Declaration, and also to subscribe to the Paris and Vancouver principles. In conclusions, schools provide safe spaces, psychological support, a place for skills development, and they contribute to stability and poverty reduction. Education is central to preventing conflict and sustaining peace. I would like to finish with a question for our briefers. We have heard uh, UNICEF ED, Henrietta uh, Faure, um, mention the importance of public-private partnerships. And I would be very much uh, interested to hear from other briefers, what is their experience in this regard? How can we encourage the development of more public-private uh, partnerships uh, to improve connectivity in conflict ar uh, affected areas and their analysis or even their, their advice would be more than welcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Philippe, for your statement.
I now invite South Africa, Jerry, to take the floor. Boss Jerry, the floor is yours. Jerry, South Africa, you have the floor. We can't hear you. And mute your mic, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. There is a say in South Africa, any child is my child. Uh, with this, we want to really thank you, Niger, for this uh, initiative and other co-sponsors um, for this area formula regarding our children in conflict and post-conflict situation. The meeting is timely, Mr. President, and relevant as COVID-19 pandemic continues to create mayhem on the lives of millions of children, devastating children, vulnerable groups, communities worldwide. And governments, as we heard from oral ministers from Niger and Rwanda, and our colleagues from ITU, and our sister boss from UNICEF, are doing so many things to try to improve the situations by taking various measures. Disruption to education has been disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable children and girls, disabilities, refugees, terribly displaced persons. When access to education is taken away from a child, they are deprived from the basic right to education and opportunity to feel, fulfill their true potential. The protection and safety of schools is of particular importance as it forms the long-term backbone of any peace-building effort and even future development, uh, growth and sustainable development. Last month, uh, Mr. President, Security Council adopted a presidential statement under your leadership focusing on, I quote, attack on schools and emphasize the need for member states to facilitate continuation of education during armed conflict, including through distant learning and your technology, as we heard from your honorable minister. The statement also called upon member states to promote education programs and encourage international support for distant learning. And we want to really uh, thank our UNICEF, ITU, um, Ericsson's and others to help uh, in this situation. In this regard, South Africa commenced collaboration between UNICEF and the Children Radio Foundation on designing and piloting the first, first of its kind of radio education in emergency program in country central Sahel, Lake Chag Basin, and as we heard in many parts of the world. For the children in crisis, affected area, we cannot physically go to school. Such initiatives provide bro broadcast lessons, illiteracy, and numeracy. President, failure to ensure protection of children in conflict situation exposed children to further threats. The effects of armed conflict on access to education and are enormous. In this regard, it remains imperative for parties of conflict to ensure the protection of essential infrastructure, including schools, in accordance with international humanitarian law. In this context, the member states could consider taking the following measures to ensure children have access to education in conflict. First, Government and internet partners must, as we heard, work closely to diversify available options for quality education and formalize culturally suitable alternative models while maintaining learning standards. These alternative models can and should include innovative, inclusive, flexible approaches such as digital learning, broadcast lessons, or the use of education material in Braille that are responsive to learning diversity. Second, Mr. President, Governments and general partners need to work closely to address and ensure reliable use of accessible and inclusive distance learning solutions to close the child divide. And lastly, government and general partners need to focus on strengthening capacities of distance learning system, as we heard from a sister from Rwanda, to overcome the digital divide through resource provided support of teachers and parents and caregivers. President, we wish to underscore that without access to education, the gender of children living in conflict will grow up without the skills they need to contribute meaningfully to their countries. 
and as my sister um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Doreen was saying, I also want to record Nelson Mandela when he said, the power of education extends beyond development of skills we need for economic success. It can contribute to nation building and reconciliations. This reminds us that we have to do everything possible, President, to ensure access to education, including through the use of available technologies to secure our nation. I want to play on record our gratitude to the ministers of Rwanda, ministers of Niger, for what they say. We feel emboldened by this initiative, and we hope Doreen and NEFO will continue mobilizing the world in supporting all of us and other areas in the Sahel and parts of Africa. Thanks so much, President, for this initiative. Thank you, Jerry, for your statement. I now call on, Ch on China. Ambassador Chuang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Abari, and uh, Excellencies, colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Nejay for organizing this event. And also, I would like to express uh, our appreciation to all the briefers uh, for their very informative and uh, inspiring presentations. Uh, in early September, under the initiative of Niger, the Security Council held an open debate on children and armed conflict with the theme of attacks on schools, a grave violation of children's rights. At that meeting, many council members stressed that digital technology and the distance learning could provide greater education opportunities for children affected by conflict. This was also included in the presidential statement adopted by the council. This area formula meeting is a continuation and a follow-up of the open debate and the presidential statement. It pro provides us a good opportunity to discuss how to safeguard children's right to education in conflict and the post-conflict context. China commands Nizai for e initiating this e event, and we are happy to co-host it. There are more than 500 million children around the world living in countries affected by conflict or disaster. Their rights to education often cannot be guaranteed. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbates the plight of those children, further limits their learning opportunities. What is encouraging is the wave of digitalization has made it possible for children in every corner of the world have equal access to education. The flexibility and accessibility of digital education lowers the learning threshold for the most vulnerable and the poorest children. However, the digital barriers to education faced by children in conflict and the post-conflict context cannot be ignored. Despite the increasing av availability of digital technology, Children affected by war and poverty usually have few opportunities in the digital age. The digital divide is a real challenge for many countries. The lack of digital infrastructure, weak technical capacity, and the high cost of digital equipment are all obstacles to the promotion of digital education. The international community should step up its efforts to ensure that no country or child is left behind in the digital age. China calls for enhanced digital infrastructure and capacity building and in increased digital technical assistance to conflict and poor countries. We welcome the digital education projects being promoted by UNICEF and ITU and encourage relevant international organizations to give full play to their respective strengths and carry out more meaningful 
and effective programs. China has entered the digital age with its digital economy accounting for more than 30% of its GDP. China, based on its technological strength, is ready to provide strong support for universal connectivity and let digital education benefit those countries and children in urgent need. Let's work together to accelerate the advancement of digital technology and achieve connectivity for all children so that they can have a better life through quality education. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Chuang. I now give the floor to Germany. Gunther, the floor is yours. Abari, thank you very much. And I thank the organizers for this important debate. Thanks a lot also to the briefers. In 2011, Germany put forward resolution 1998 which set in place important standards and provisions for the protection of schools and hospitals. In spite of progress that has been made since then, we see that attacks and threats of attacks against schools are on the rise. We condemn these attacks in the strongest possible terms. The initiative by Nigeria and Belgium to update resolution 1998 with a presidential statement has raised the bar. The statement referenced, I quote, the need of continuation of education during armed conflict, including through distance learning and digital technology, unquote, a timely topic of today. While already prior to the pandemic, more than 250 million children were denied their basic right to education, the threat of COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation, causing the largest disruption of education in history. More than 1.5 billion children and um, young people were and are still affected. In situations of conflict, this is of particular concern. Children are deprived of their basic education. They are often also stripped of any access to health services and regular food supply, as these functions and services are frequently provided for through schools. One thing is therefore key. Children must go back to school as soon as possible. However, distance learning programs could offer access to education in cases where the physical opening of schools remains not feasible or the distance to a school makes attendance impossible. In order to make this possible, it is therefore crucial to close the digital divide and ensure that digital technology is accessible for everyone, everywhere. Germany welcomes the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation as an important contribution on a path which will lead to the advancement of global digital cooperation. We are ready to engage in the upcoming discussions for the implementation of the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. Let me bring up one more dimension. It is crucial to protect children's rights everywhere in times of crisis and in times of peace. Germany, together with Brazil, is the penholder of the resolution on the right to privacy in the General Assembly. Children exercising their right to education could not, should not be compelled to give up their right to safety and privacy. Efforts to expand connectivity and digital learning should safeguard children's privacy and protect them from any harm. 
Thank you. I thank you, Gunter, for your statement. I now invite uh, Juan from the Dominican Republic to take the floor. And mute your mic. Yes, yes, I just did, Mr. President. Thank you very much. I would like first to um, express how honored we are, Mr. President, to be co-sponsors with you uh, in, of this meeting. And, and thank you for your leadership and initiative. And of course, the briefers for their observations and, and recommendations. Mr. President, in many places, particularly in conflict situations, the global pandemic is posing unprecedented risks to education. But even before the COVID-19 pandemic, 250 million children were already out of school. The majority of them living in country affected, conflict affected countries. Now, this has, this has made the divide even wider amid the, amid the pandemic. And the hope for many of them to return to school is non-existent. Girls are even facing additional risks of exploitation, early marriage, pregnancy, and child labor. Although conflict-affected environments are particularly challenges for their use, ICTs con have considerable potential to provide safe education solution for these children. We commend UNICEF, the ITU, and their partners for the laudable work on the ground in closing the digital gap and enhancing connectivity for many of these children. Among the most vulnerable are those with limited or no internet access who are disproportionately affected by the pandemic as they cannot transition easily from classrooms from to online learning. So this is, such is the case of many refugee children in Cox Bazar who are not receiving education amidst the pandemic because of government-imposed internet, internet restrictions. Mr. President, the use of distance learning solutions in many contexts, either radio or telephones, online learning, all depends on the access to energy. In contexts where infrastructure has been destroyed, damaged, or, or even never built, Delivering remote education is relatively impossible. Thus, it is fundamental to build and protect energy and ICT's infrastructure that will support distance and digital learning, especially in remote areas, in order to reach the most marginalized children, including those with disabilities and their communities. Contingency plans need to be in place to provide support when digital opportunities are not available. Education must be better funded in humanitarian response. So we call on donors to provide multi-year and flexible financing to partners or partner organizations that support education during and after the, the pandemic in conflict and post-conflict conflict situations, and to scale up their protection programs for children, particularly to girls that have not been able to go back to school. This includes psychological support and social emo emotional learning in regardless of modality. Countries that are hosting displaced and refugee children need to ensure that they are included in national education initiatives. As an example that this can be done, Burkina Faso has expressed that COVID-19 related distance learning programs extends to students affected by conflict. The truth is that digital technology can enhance learning, but digital solutions alone are not enough. Above all, political will is essential to protect the right that all children have to access to a safe and quality education in any context and under any circumstance. Children in conflict must not pay a double price. We all, governments, UN agencies, the private sector, must join forces now to meet their needs or else, as some, so many have said, we risk to lose even more 
than we already have from this pandemic. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Juan. I now give the floor to Gert Estonia. Thank you, Avarin. Uh, we thank Niger for this initiative, which is based on the Security Council discussions, uh, but at the same time takes us out of our usual box, looking at the new realities around us. I would like to point out why this topic is very close for Estonia. As a member of the Security Council, Estonia has set the protection of children in conflict and the impact of new technologies among its priorities. We for firmly support the Council's call to ensure the continuation of education in conflict and post-conflict settings, to break the cycle of violence, provide knowledge and skills, and to reintegrate those caught in conflict. We believe digital technology helps us do that. We believe that digital is an equalizer. It gives those who are disadvantaged or vulnerable, including those affected by conflict, the opportunities to gain education and skills that they would not otherwise have access to. This aim is also echoed in the findings of the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, which state that by 2030, every adult should have affordable access to digital networks. Building connectivity and infrastructure is key. In 1996, five years after regaining its independence, Estonia launched Tiger Leap, a project which aimed inter alia to connect all schools in Estonia to the internet and to equip them with the hard and software necessary. This was supported by teacher training. That generation of children has now grown up and the benefits of the education and skills they gained have multiplied. Our goal is to share what we have learned and do our part in reducing the digital divide, including digital gender divide. We are contributing to the development of e-services globally, notably in Africa, through the digital memorandum between Estonia and the African Union. For refugee youth, the Estonian NGO Mondo has developed a digital competency program. The program has been successfully implemented for DRC refugees in Uganda and Syrian refugees in Lebanon. We have supported the UNICEF Innovation Fund and UNICEF African Youth Digital Innovation Initiative. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the greatest disruption of education systems in history, affecting 1.6 billion learners. Refugee children and youth were already at a grave disadvantage before. Half of them were out of school. Girls are in an especially vulnerable situation. Based on UNHCR data, the Malala Fund has estimated that as a result of COVID-19, half of all refugee girls in secondary school will not return when classrooms reopen. Coordinated action between all stakeholders, including the private sector, is crucial to minimize the risk of a lost generation. Reimagining education needs to go together with steps to ensure the well-being and safety of children online through safe and inclusive online platforms, building awareness and prevention skills of children and youth, their parents, caregivers and teachers. Data protection and clear guidance is essential to ensure the safety and privacy of children, and the safety of schools in conflict situations. Mr. Chair, we agree that the new technologies can strengthen the opportunities to ensure education in conflict and post-conflict settings. It is no longer a detail, but a key tool. I thank you very much. I thank you, Gert. I now give the floor to Halima, St. Vincent and the Grenadine. Thank you, Ambassador Barry, and we commend Niger for organizing this event and welcome the thoughtful briefings from our distinguished panel. St. Vincent and the Grenadines affirms that a child's right to quality education must be universally prioritized and safeguarded. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis has deepened existing disparities in access to education, with the worst effects experienced by children in countries and regions affected by conflict and climate change. As we reimagine and real, realign education in response to COVID-19 mitigation measures, it is our moral responsibility to ensure no child is left behind. This means amplifying our efforts to make quality education accessible with keen focus on displaced children, children in reintegration programs, 
girls, and children with disabilities. We must tackle the gender, class, racial, and geographic inequalities that continue to maintain the digital divide. If we are to harness technology and connectivity in support of quality education. The COVID-19 crisis places into sharper focus the need for clear solidarity actions by the entire multilateral system, regional bodies, national governments, civil society, and the private sector. We highlight the following actions in support of democratizing technology and connectivity for quality education globally. The implementation of actions outlined in the September 2010 20 presidential statement, urging us to support distance and digital technology in conflict affected countries. The need to track and scale up existing innovative strategies and actions, such as those outlined by our distinguished ministers, Executive Director Four and Director Bogdan Martin. We also commend groups like the Lebanese Alternative Learning Foundation as part of a public-private partnership for their commitment to providing digital support programs to children in rural areas and for the insistence that technology function as an equalizing force in education. Placing their digital library in a small box and making it available to multiple users offline has improved access to education for children in rural areas. There is urgent need to initiate, enhance, streamline, cost, and fund action and operational plans at the national and regional levels, and in collaboration with civil society and international partners like UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, and others. These should prioritize tech support and connectivity for diverse children affected by conflict. State, regional, and multilateral private public-private partnerships to fund quality education with the requisite tech and connectivity support is crucial in this regard. We also call for capacity building in the use of technology for teachers, parents, families, and communities to ensure that a sense of community is built around students in support of teaching and learning. Strategies for assessing and addressing learning gaps as a result of the multiple shocks experienced by children in conflict-affected countries must also be pursued. And finally, actions to make education accessible must be connected to broader security and socioeconomic development strategies. I thank you. Thank you, Halima. I now give the floor to friends. Yara, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Um, bonjour, Mesdames et Messieurs. I wish to begin by thanking Major Consponsor and Alder Griffo. I would also like to emphasize that the work of all the actors on the ground committed to child protection and education, especially in the context of conflict, but also in the context of the pandemic. I also commend the UNESCO action on this issue in conjunction with the other national United Nations actors such as IQ and UNICEF. A well-coordinated action is indeed crucial for any action in this matter to be sufficient. In the same vein, France encourages the initiative led by Niger Rwanda, among others, to ensure broader access to education using digital technology, including access to connectivity. We should also adopt a more holistic approach by taking into account access to energy, high stated by one, and the greener, the better. I wish to reiterate for support to the presidential statement on this key topic facilitated by Niger and Belgium. The PRST underlines the need for continuation of education during armed conflict, including through distance learning and digital technology. And as we all know, education and development are strongly linked, as stated by the international community with the ODD4 related to education and bearing in mind that development is also key to prevent conflict. Digital learning is more important than ever. The COVID pandemic has unfortunately reminded us forcefully that access to education is never guaranteed and more than ever needed. The right to education, particularly for girls and teenage girls, is under threat, as underlined by our colleagues from Belgium. 
Not only are we to promote girl education by ensuring that they have access and get into school, but we must also prevent closure of school, lack of possibility for distance learning due to multiple factors, including inequality between the have and the have not, as stated previously by the representative of UNICEF, and the connected and those not has underlined by Minister Gibasaidi of Niger. Do new technologies will allow the decrease of risk of dropping out of school, whether for forced marriage or forced or early entry into the labor market, including to support the family livelihood? This is a question, of course, we will have to answer. It is more than concerning that inequalities between children to access education are being particularly exacerbated in every part of the world with more accuracy in armed conflict contexts, but also among displaced population and children in refugee camp. We cannot consider the use of new technology and education without touching upon some challenges. Indeed, we should bear in mind the situation of cyberbullying and cyber threat due to the increased use of digital tools and social networks. Our efforts should hence focus on striking a balance between access to that the digital environment and digital citizenship education, including the personal, the protection of personal data as well, especially in the context of armed conflict and for the protection of the most vulnerable. France will continue to play an active role and we reiterate our call for the universal endorsement of the Paris principle and commitment, as well as the Safe Schools Declaration. Furthermore, we are working with UNESCO to launch the online distance learning platform, My Class à la Maison, My Classroom at Home, to say it in English, aimed to be launched in Francophone African countries, according and taking into account, of course, their context and expectations. France also will commit to the Global Partnership for Education with a contribution of 200 million for 2000 and 2020. Because girls cannot be left behind, France is also namely supporting the implementation of protective environment for girls in school through the Gender at the Center Initiative. I had two questions for the brief, uh, but I think that my colleagues from Belgium already have already asked them. It was, of course, the way the UN and member states will help to strengthen partnership with the private sector and to promote, actually, how to promote international cooperation in order to strengthen infrastructure in conflict and post-conflict settings. Thank you. Je vous remercie tous. Thank you, friends. Merci beaucoup. I now give the floor to all the council members. I give the floor to Vietnam. Thuy, you have the floor. Thuy, Vietnam, the floor is yours. Since Kui is not with us, I give the floor to the Russian Federation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Do you hear me? Yes, clear and loud. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We would like to thank you, uh, other organizers, and uh, our briefers today for their remarks as well as uh, other uh, comments that were made. And of course, during this challenging time with pandemic, we felt the importance of digital technologies in everyday lives. But we see today's discussion as a part of much broader context related to the global development agenda as a whole. We've noted that some delegations mentioned uh, safe school declarations and other uh, things related to today's topic, uh, I think we will not uh, go into the realm of international humanitarian law today. We discussed it at length uh, during the Security Council meeting that was mentioned, and this perspective were uh, quite well discussed. Uh, 
Uh, we also want to say that uh, the Safe School Declaration is a political initiative of group of states that does not enjoy universal uh, support yet. Uh, we would rather emphasize that uh, international humanitarian law must be observed and it is important uh, to proceed from the universally recognized legal instruments. But uh, today I would like to focus on the development uh, perspective and uh, thanks to digital platforms and their quick uh, operationalization, uh, uh, many people managed to continue their jobs amidst global lockdowns and uh, continue education. Access to digital technologies has played a critical role in helping children stay within educational systems. Uh, and it is not easy, of course, in developed countries, but it is even stronger challenge in countries in conflicts and in post-conflict situations. Uh, I would also like to uh, refer to the Secretary General's brief, Education During COVID-19 and Beyond. Uh, yes, only 50% of children in low-income countries have access to distance learning. This statistics is sad, but we, uh, it is also sobering that we need to accelerate efforts to improve the quality of education with the focus on connecting schools to safer internet and all level, at all levels. We would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Mrs. Four uh, and, and uh, also <clears throat> Chao of ITU for participation in the sixth meeting of BRICS Ministers of Communications. Uh, hosted by the government of the Russian Federation on September 17th this year. Uh, among other things, the final declaration of this meeting acknowledged the critical role of information and communication technologies in promoting high quality education, as well as reaffirmed the need for continuous cooperation of member states in ICT activities. And at the international level, we have to strengthen cooperation with relevant UN funds and programs who have presence on the ground and know the difficulties and needs of children. And I also, uh, we're honored today with the presence of uh, Ms. Four and uh, would like to <clears throat> say that uh, education is one of the priority areas of Russia's development assistance. Uh, and let me use the opportunity to share some examples of projects that uh, we do in this end, to this end. Uh, together with UNICEF, uh, we're implementing a project in Syria aimed, among other things, at rehabilitating the educational system in Damascus. The activities under this component include teacher professional development programs and equipment delivery in support of the integrated education services for around 700 students. Russia and UNDP have been implementing nine uh, respective projects in a number of countries, of course, including the African region and in CIS countries, uh, Cambodia and others. Uh, the goal of those projects is to facilitate access of young people to jobs by developing their digital skills. We also have an interesting project uh, uh, for CIS countries called Climate Box, uh, it's launched in 2017 and is aimed at improving children's knowledge on climate change via specially designed online programs. Uh, thank you for your attention, colleagues. Thank you, Russia. I now give the floor to UK. James, you have the floor. Many thanks, um, Avari, and, and thank you. Um, to Niger and the co-sponsors for organizing today's timely um, ARIA meeting. And, and thank you also to our brilliant panelists uh, for their thought-provoking contributions. Um, uh, Abari, I was, I was posted um, to Sierra Leone um, just after the conflict um, finished there um, in the middle of uh, the 2000s. And I have to say one of the most uplifting sights um, during my time there was seeing children going to school, um, smart in their uniforms, um, happy, but also aware because of their deprivation during the conflict, um, how lucky they were. Um, and last month, the Security Council agreed a landmark um, presidential statement, which many have referred to, condemning 
attacks on schools and affirming the right to education for all children. And the UK welcomes the Council's attention um, here today on this important issue. Because schools offer children opportunity, um, but they also offer a sense of normalcy um, as well as protection in times of war. And as we all know, quality education plays an important role in reducing conflict and promoting peace. But far too often, schools are threatened and targeted, um, indirectly damaged in hostilities, and children are forced out of schools, exposing them to greater risk of recruitment and use of sexual violence and other grave violations. And girls who are already less likely to receive any type of education compared to boys, as we've heard time and time again today, are disproportionately impacted by attacks and school closures. That's why ensuring all girls have access to 12 years of quality education is a top UK priority. And our commitment to supporting and promoting education in emergencies is also why we endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration and call on other member states to do the same. I note that our colleague Dmitry from Russia just noted that not all states have endorsed it yet. I hope that he will join us in saying that hopefully soon um, we will have full endorsement. But this year we witnessed disruption uh, to education on a massive scale and so many of us have talked about this uh, because while all member states have struggled to provide continuity for children's safe access to schooling during the COVID-19 pandemic, conflict affected and post-conflict countries have faced a special difficulties. There is a significant risk that children in these contexts, particularly those facing pre-existing barriers to education, will never return to school. But the pandemic has potentially presented a new opportunity and momentum to improve distance learning capabilities and expand access to digital technologies for education. We recognize the significant potential of these tools to improve children's access to education in conflict and other vulnerable circumstances. And we welcome the GIGA initiative and efforts by UNICEF and the International Telecommunications Union in this regard, and it was great to hear about them today. The international community must ensure that the lessons learned in delivering education during the pandemic are adapted and applied in emergency settings. Success will depend on expanding access to affordable and reliable energy, particularly for remote and marginalized communities. And it will also require heightened child safeguarding measures, including the protection of children's personal data and information. Now, we are proud to co-lead on the Recovering Better for Sustainability initiative um, to promote a recovery that accelerates, not slows, delivery of the sustainable development goals. And this has to be part of the thinking around that. And we are using significant investment and influence within the international system to leverage a strong and coordinated education response globally. And we're working bilaterally with countries to support education systems to bring girls and the most vulnerable back to school. We committed an additional 6.4 million to education cannot wait to support emergency education in fragile contexts during the COVID-19 crisis and $6.8 million of new funding to UNHCR to enable over 5,500 teachers to provide vital education for children in 10 refugee hosting countries. So Abari, in 2019, to mark the 30th anniversary of the CRC, the UK endorsed the pledge for every child, every right. This commitment holds in conflict and pandemic and we must all do more to ensure all children's right to education is a reality. Thank you again for the conversation today. Thank you, James. I now call on Vietnam. Vietnam, if you are with us, you have the floor. Mr. President, I wish to thank you for convening this meeting. 
I'm also grateful to the Assistant Secretary General, the UNICEF Executive Directors and Minister from Niger and Rwanda for their insights. Uh, Mr. President, normally school is a safe space where children can be protected from threats and crises. However, attacks on school have increased in recent years and hinder school access to education. As a result of having leaders or no schooling, children are most likely to suffer from gender-based violence, sexual violence, early marriage, and they are not fully equipped with basic knowledge for their life. The long-term impacts of uh, this lack of access on children's uh, education have raised serious concerns. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemics have also exacerbated these situations. A million of the children who could most benefit from digital technology are missing out. In this context, we share the view that digital technologies and connectivity plays a very important role. Mr. President, to show the root cause of this problem, we wish to highlight some following points. Firstly, we, the party to the conflict should end school attacks and ensure that all children have full access to basic needs, including education, health, transportation, and information. In this endeavor, states bear the primary responsibility and authorities to protect and care for their civilians, especially children in armed conflicts, including facilitating the continuation of education through digital technology and distant learning. A comprehensive approach in applying digital technology is also needed. Secondly, children protection should be consistently integrated in peace processes and peace agreements in their particular need for and must be included in post-conflict planning. Third, the role of UNICEF, relevant United Nations agencies and international community in connectivity in is indispensable. Coordination among agencies and actors should be enhanced to maximize cash resource, avoid duplication of works, and strategically address issues of common concerns. Mr. President, being a country where generations of children have suffered immensely from devastating war, even today, Vietnam is making every possible effort to care for and protect children with disability caused by explosive remains, remnants of war and Asian, and Asian orange. Vietnam will continue to work with their member states and other international community to defend and promote the bad interests of children affected by armed conflicts. Mr. President, I thank you. Thank you, Vietnam. I now call on the United States. Chair, it, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, I, okay, wonderful. Thank you for the confirmation. Um, I just want to thank, join others in thanking uh, Executive Director Henrietta for also Assistant Secretary Martin for your um, really insightful remarks. Um, and for being here. I also want to thank the ministers of Niger and Rwanda uh, for the insight that they have provided uh, today as well on, these important, on this important topic. As the Security Council discussed just last month, children in the Central Sahel are acutely experiencing the impact of conflict and displacement, which compromises their consistent and reliable access to education. And I know this is what everyone has been uh, commenting and, and expressing concern about this morning. With nearly 650,000 children affected by school closures in the region, the surge of armed violence across Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger is having a devastating impact, not only uh, on children and young people's survival, but also on their development. And Mr. President, this is why we are so grateful that Niger has called this aria today. It's such an important topic. Uh, this is especially true for girls, 132 million of whom continue to lack access to education worldwide. For the United States, ensuring that girls have equitable educational opportunities is critical for their ability to enter into the workforce and for their broader political and economic empowerment. 
the COVID-19 pandemic has as well made, more, made it more clear than ever that the digital access and internet connectivity in particular are critical to determining whether a child can maintain access to education amid disruptive circumstances. We've all, we've all seen this, um, but it's very, it's very acute um, in the areas that we're talking about today. Depriving children of education can trap families and communities in self-reinforcing cycles of violence, poverty, and disadvantage. Conversely, educational attainment is directly linked to household resilience and keeping families on a positive trajectory out of poverty. As such, it's clear that the digital access and internet connectivity remain critical enablers of sustainable development and contribute to improving the quality of life for people around the world. The United States has recognized this and has taken action in this regard. The Trump administration recently released a comprehensive digital strategy through 2024, which recognizes that equal access to digital Technology is critical for fostering development in our partner countries. Several elements of the strategy specifically address children's access to technology, digital literacy, the gender divide, and protection from digital harm. As we mentioned in the Security Council last month, the United States has also recently provided 2.3 million to extend Education Cannot Wait Pro Burkina Faso First Emergency Response Program to sustain education services for displaced and host community learners in conflict, conflict, conflict excuse me, affected communities. So Mr. President, we thank Niger for bringing this topic to the attention of the Security Council and pledge to continue our work to bridge the digital divide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherid. I now give the floor to Indonesia. Roy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, we thank Niger and other co-sponsoring countries for convening this meeting. Uh, ensuring children's access to quality education uh, has been a dire challenge in conflict, even more so during the, uh, this particular con pandemic situations. Uh, it is pertinent to initially create enabling environment for the safety and security of all children, including the school infrastructure. Uh, digital technology and connectivity are important as supporting tools, uh, depending on the conditions. Uh, allow me to share some thoughts uh, on this particular issue, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, all children's future is jeopardized without education. Technology, at least, enables children in conflict and post-conflict situations to connect their hope to education and disconnect from the despair of conflict. Uh, we are pleased that UNICEF and ITU have launched the GIGA initiative that aims to connect every school to the internet. It offers a chance for children to cultivate their curious minds with educational information and not shape their mind with violence. In post-conflict situation, Education is a key for sustaining peace. Education provides opportunity for young generations, not only to gain knowledge, but also to embrace efforts of peace building. Uh, second, uh, working directly with local communities. Uh, it is a crucial first step to understand the top needs of a community in conflict situation and identify their practical solution for education. Uh, we thank all partners uh, that beat the odds during the pandemic to keep children learning through TV or radio or other innovative uh, methods. Uh, Indonesian peacekeepers have also worked with local communities to assist them in promoting teaching and learning activities through civil military cooperation and the use of smart cars as a tool for mobile learning. Uh, to share a little bit our experience, Mr. Chair, Indonesia has launched an innovation-focused program called Merdeka Belajar, or Freedom to Learn, in 2020. Uh, during this pandemic, the program offers easy-to-use online quizzes, uh, exams, and daily exercises that engage teachers, students, and parents all together. Third, the need to strengthen coordination among relevant UN bodies, as well as continue promoting multi-stakeholders approach. 
because of its cross-cutting nature, education itself always requires synergy of all related stakeholders to provide access for children. Uh, the magnitude of this issue is too big to be handled only by one stakeholder only. Uh, national efforts of government and continued efforts of UN agencies, regional organizations, and civil society organizations are equally important in restoring such access. Uh, Mr. Chair, during our presidency last month in the uh, Council, Indonesia held a high-level meeting on pandemics and challenges of sustaining peace, in which our foreign minister stressed that, and I quote, we need to focus on strengthening institutional capacities and resources of conflict-affected countries, end quote. And we believe that one of the most important area is the area of education. Uh, digital technology is a vital enabler of education through remote teaching and online learning. We need enhanced partnership and greater leadership and need to really behind innovative initiative to connect every school in the world to the internet by 2030. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Roy. I now give the floor to non-security council members. I give the floor to the Kingdom of Morocco. Hilal, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, très cher frère Abdou, I would like uh, first of all to extend my heartfelt thanks to, to you for organizing this important and timely area for Mula meeting of the Security Council as we are witnessing the tangible and multifaceted impact of conflict, humanitarian emergencies and natural disasters on access to education adding to this the current COVID-19 pandemic, which literally shakes up the world's education system. I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Ford, the Executive Director of UNICEF, for her informative and inspiring presentation, and through her to the UNICEF staff for their tremendous work for children all around the world, especially in fragile and difficult situations. Having been president and vice president of UNICEF Executive Board for the last two years, I can testify personally of the dedication and abnegation of the executive director for and her very efficient staff in this regard. For the sake of time, I would uh, like to highlight the following three points. One million of children around the world, especially those living in fragile conflict, affected contexts and vulnerable situations are already five times more likely to be out of school than their peers. As Filippo Grandi, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, rightly said, and they quote, it is fundamental that children who have been uprooted by war and violence are not left behind even further. We must be smart about finding solutions because education ensured that a generation that was unfortunate to be displaced from their homes is not also being displaced from a future of opportunities because enjoying the right to education in an inclusive manner and in a safe environment gives them hope for a better future. Two, Deploying innovative and inclusive solutions to reach vulnerable children, particularly those in conflict situations, migrants, refugees, pregnant, adolescents, and children with disabilities through di digital technology and reliable connectivity with context-responsive pedagogical content and fully trained teachers are key to deliver quality learning opportunities no matter the circumstances. In this regard, access to internet is critical. However, almost half of the world's population does not have access to basic internet services. The digital divide is exacerbated in low-income countries and even more the Latins in rural locations. Access to digital learning and mobile technologies in conflict settings and emergencies is far more challenging. Third, 
bridging digital divides and investing in numerical infrastructure are inevitable. Connecting communities and improving service delivery to children and their families, especially the most vulnerable communities, are enablers of durable peace and sustainable development. At the same time, digitization requires a significant investment. In this regard, global cooperation, public-private partnerships, and international organizations play a critical role in closing the digital divide and accelerating digital transformation. As final note, I would like to underline that achieving the SDGs by 2030 is about how we will get there. In the agenda, we agree that, and they quote, the spread of information and communications technology and global and connectivities and, con and connectivities has great potential to accelerate human progress, to bridge the digital divide, and to develop knowledge societies. End of quote. Our joint effort should turn around building an inclusive future that offers equal digital opportunities for everyone. Improving the next generation's connectivity starts from closing the digital gaps today. I thank you for your kind attention, Mr. President and honorable members. Thank you, Omar Hilal, for your, for your statement. I now give the, spot, the floor to Denmark, Martin, who will speak on behalf of the Nordic countries, namely Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of Finland, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, and my own country, uh, Denmark. I'd like to, at the outset, uh, express the Nordic countries' uh, deep appreciation to Niger, Belgium, the Dominican Republic, China, Estonia, France, Germany, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines in South Africa for organizing this important uh, meeting on universal connectivity and access to digital technology in, in conflict situations. And I want to thank also uh, the briefers uh, for their uh, valuable insights. And I want to add my voice to Omar's uh, voice in thanking uh, the executive director of UNICEF uh, and, and all the staff of UNICEF for the excellent work uh, they do. Now, education is key to long-term peace and security and sustainable development. We all know this. Education is a human right. When children are deprived of education, it will have an enormous impact, not only for the individuals concerned, but for society uh, as a whole. Now, with nearly half of all learners still affected by school closures, the COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the need for accelerating the efforts towards connectivity growth. Children living in conflict-affected areas face even greater risk and challenges in accessing safe education. The latest report by the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict of June this year verified 927 attacks on schools and hospitals. In such situations, digital technology is an essential tool in the efforts to facilitate the continuation of education in conflict affected communities. And we must make sure that the technological solutions developed are fit for purpose in this respect. Now, digitalization and connectivity also means increased digital risk, let's be honest, not least for children in situations of conflicts and vulnerability. Due considerations to the principles of protection of personal data and do no harm should therefore guide our work in this area. Education is also key to promote societies where girls have equal rights and opportunities, protected from harmful practices and provided with the means to be independent and self-reliant. Without access to continued learning, children are at a higher risk of domestic violence, sexual abuse, child early and forced marriages and unwanted pregnancies as well as recruitment by armed forces or armed groups in situations of conflict. Ensuring connectivity and access to devices along with teacher capacities and appropriate educational content is crucial. However, to ensure girls access to continued learning, it is also necessary to address the digital gender divide. Now in low and middle income countries, 165 million fewer women own a, mobile, own a phone than girls. Um, sort of on a mobile phone compared to men. And in many countries, boys are one and a half times more likely to own a phone than girls. 
In Sub-Saharan Africa, data suggests that information technology skills are facilitated by schooling, but there may be gender-related barriers that prevent adolescent girls from developing these skills to the same extent as boys. In more than half of the countries analyzed by UNICEF, adolescent boys use computers and the internet more frequently than girls. Gender norms that limit girls' use of digital technologies may contribute to this gap. Important work is being done to bridge the digital gender divide, including through the African Girls Can Code initiative, which is working to empower women and girls to pursue a career in the field of information and communication technology. When adopting policies and integrating digital technologies, it is crucial to account for the challenges in ensuring connectivity for all. Moving forward, we must continue to be guided by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including the principle of leaving no one behind. And therefore, technological solutions to enable distance learning must be developed with the aim to reach those furthest behind, including women and girls, displaced persons, and persons with disabilities. We believe that it is necessary with a whole of society approach in order to succeed in closing the digital divide. We need to include all relevant actors, such as local authorities, civil society, the private sector, teachers and caretakers, along with relevant humanitarian and development actors. For example, we need to ensure access to the necessary hardware required for learning programs, and we need to support teachers in adapting to new ways of teaching. Today's digital infrastructure is largely driven by the private sector, even in countries affected by conflict. Tech companies design, they implement, and they run everything from the underlying technical elements, elements invisible uh, to most of us, such as cable and satellite, to the devices and online platforms we need in our hands to go online. Being gatekeepers for connectivity calls for great societal responsibility. When connecting the world through their services, so tech companies have a responsibility to include vulnerable groups and ensure reliable connectivity for people caught in areas of conflict or disaster where the internet can be the only way to uphold schooling and education. Once connectivity and the necessary uh, hardware is in place, access to relevant high quality content that complies with best practice in privacy and security is of crucial importance. The Digital Public Goods Alliance works to facilitate the discovery, the development, the use of, and the investment in digital public goods in order to accelerate the attainment of the SDGs in low and middle income countries, and is thus critical uh, to, this, to this work. Now, we welcome the important work of the GIGA initiative to reimagine education, if you like, and to increase connectivity to schools in the world, especially in those countries that are or have been affected by conflict as well as other important partnerships, such as the Digital Public Goods Alliance that I just mentioned. The Nordic countries urge all UN member states to continue efforts to ensure connectivity for all with the aim of expanding access to education to children in conflict-affected areas. This is essential for long-term peace and security and sustainable development in affected countries, and it is the right of every child on the face of this planet. I thank you. Thank you, Martin, for your statement. I now give the floor to Stefania from UNESCO. Mm -hmm. Stefania, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me thank really the permanent delegation of Niger for the opportunity to address uh, this Security Council area formula meeting. And let me first uh, congratulate my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Doreen and Rita, uh, about the GIGA partnership and all the great job they're doing, we are doing together, I should say, about a point which is crucial, especially in this new scenario, connectivity in education and the role of connectivity. As the last speaker, I think I have the, the duty of brevity, so I will try to focus uh, straight on, on one specific point, the role of partnership uh, in this new kind of very much disrupted uh, scenario. Uh, in education internationally and how can we do together better and more in order to assure the right to education which, is become, which, which has become largely dependent on connectivity. Uh, for lack of it, education uh, has been interrupted altogether for hundreds of millions 
uh, of millions of children and youth since the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, last March, we, we, we started to monitor uh, data, you remember, and you know, 1.6 billion at the peak of the, of the crisis, uh, uh, and now today, uh, almost 800 million students out of school because of COVID-19. And children and youth in conflict and crisis settings are among the most vulnerable in the world, coping each day with fear and loss uh, and uh, struggling with the right to education. They are not even safe in school because their schools are targets of attack. So education represents uh, the, their only hook for the future. And uh, UNESCO held the pen on the Secretary General's policy brief already mentioned many times today that warned on the risk of a, of a concrete uh, generational catastrophe without urgent action. Well, universal connectivity is one of them. And one of the flagships of UNESCO Global Education Coalition that now uh, has mobilized so far 150 partners uh, and, uh, and all the UN system is there and also the private sector is there. In this, uh, in this coalition, we are focusing uh, uh, on uh, some flagships, uh, teachers uh, to be supported and to be equipped with skills, uh, gender not to be left girls behind more than they were before, and technology, of course. Uh, technology which is not a luxury. It's a lifeline in times of crisis and conflict, uh, one that can really be uh, the, the, the only gateway uh, or, or to learning. So to push forward and uh, as the next steps of partnership I see, uh, we are launching the Life's Lines to Learning Initiative to prepare the ground for member states uh, led declaration on connectivity for education. And this initiative aligns uh, with the Secretary General's roadmap on connectivity and very much complements the work uh, the great work of the Broadband Commission, the GIGA initiative, as well as the joint efforts by ITU and UNICEF. So today it takes uh, a global network, uh, global village to educate a child, let me say like this. And we are quite committed to bring full support to realize in this right. Thank you very much, over. Thanks to Stefania, the last speaker on my list. I will now give uh, the floor to the briefers in order for them to answer the questions. I don't know who is going to, to take the floor first. Mr. Chairman, I can jump in if I may. Okay, as you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to maybe focus on the partnership angle, which I think was was raised by by so many of our distinguished um, ambassadors in their interventions. And I, I just want to stress that really partnership and collaboration is the only option here. We have um, 3.6 billion people not connected. And the only way we're going to get this done is really through through partnerships and, and collaboration. Um, and as we heard from many, it's not just a technology issue. Uh, it, it, there are so many other factors from teachers to caregivers, um, and it really requires all hands on deck. In terms of specific examples, the ITU has actually a, a sort of unique membership structure in that we have 800 private sector companies that are part of the ITU family. So we do have quite extensive private sector experience. And Stefania just mentioned, and Her Excellency Minister Paula as well, the Broadband Commission. That's a great example of a multi-stakeholder partnership that has come together to advocate for digital connectivity in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. I heard many colleagues mention as well uh, the digital gender gap, and that's a huge task to, uh, to solve. And we have the Equals Global Partnership uh, that we've created with a number of UN agencies and a number of you with us today, including Denmark, where we have our African Girls Can Code work, and we try to tackle that digital divide in terms of, of access, in terms of skills and representation in the sector. Our Smart Village work is also a great example of partnerships with many UN agencies having joined together, satellite operators, mobile operators, 
and others. And our work as well in, in the mobile health space is another great example with pharmaceutical companies, WHO, telecom operators, and much more. And finally, GIGA. I think GIGA is where all the pieces come together, if I may say. It's bold, it's ambitious, and it's absolutely necessary, and I believe doable. Uh, and it's an opportunity for all of us to join together to get it done. Uh, through GIGA, as I mentioned before, we will have the ability to actually drive digital transformation and digital empowerment through entire communities. Uh, it is that once in a generation chance and, and we really need to, to step up and we can make those uh, rapid um, and real strides forward. Uh, and to borrow from the ambassador from South Africa, uh, Ambassador Jerry, I feel emboldened, as he said, uh, by this discussion and we can get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you, ASG Doreen. Ministers, do you want to add something on your, uh, on your presentation? Thank you, Chairman. I think uh, um, to a large, Doreen has covered or uh, summarized very well a lot of the uh, key points that came out from the feedback that we got from the different speakers. I just wanted to add one thing. I think the need has always been there. Uh, in, in our different strategies, we are all talking about 21st century skills. Uh, and when you unpack that, you're talking about you know new ways of working, of thinking, and the internet uh, one uh, for one gives us uh, and gives our students the access to resources, but also expands uh, their worldview, uh, expands their levels of creativity. And so I think for us, even just going forward is that commitment. And like Doreen said, it's really the, you know, forging the necessary partnerships. Uh, we already have a coalition of governments, private sector, um, you know, the development community, that is already uh, you know, backing the GIGA initiative and many other initiatives such as this one. And I think we can only ask for more partners to join uh, so that at least as we talk about equitable access, uh, it's not just specific to key countries that have probably um, you know, embraced the idea and have taken a lead in implementing some of these uh, um, you know, encouraging initiatives, but rather when we talk about equity, it's really uh, looking at the whole global family and making sure uh, um, our children have access to these resources and to quality education all around. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for your feedback. And we do look forward to, um, you know, working together, even going forward to really uh, uh, respond to this uh, shared vision that uh, we're speaking about this uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Ingabire. Um, Minister Gimba. You want to flow? Uh, yes, Chair, uh, Chairman. Uh, I would just like to add maybe uh, a couple of points to what both uh, Doreen and uh, Paula have said. Uh, it's uh, maybe two point one is really that time is of essence. Uh, I think we all convinced that uh, that's the way to go, uh, but now it's really time to deliver. Uh, that's what I would like to stress out. Uh, we uh, have great ambition from I mean, around the world. There is a full commitment, at least from uh, the local players for the international community. Let's now uh, move forward and let's really have tangible and quick example. We have young population of indicated in my uh, um, uh, in my address. Uh, the probability of uh, winning. Uh, the jackpot is one of 175 million. So time is really of essence. That's how this sense of urgency. The second point is uh, uh, definitely there need to be a focus on the partnership, but also on enabling local ecosystem because that's what will make uh, all this sustainable. Uh, thank you, Chair, for, uh, for the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Gimba. Before Adjourning the meeting, I would like to express the sincere appreciation of the delegation of Niger to the member states, UN agencies, and to the ministers of Rwanda and Niger 
for this insightful discussion. As you know, the question of access to education in conflict and post-conflict context is a priority for Niger, for Rwanda, and several other countries. During the open debate on children and armed conflict, which Niger held during its presidency last month, we were minded of the urgency to act and to devise innovative and urgent actions to ensure that all children, regardless of their backgrounds, have their access to education and to schools protected. Access to universal connectivity could provide a breakthrough learning opportunity for children in some of the most challenging environments. This mandate is too great to be shouldered by one single entity, which is why we salute the multidisciplinary participation in today's discussion. Lastly, as today is the first time I speak as the outgoing president of the Security Council, I wish the delegation of the Russian Federation good luck in the month of October. The meeting is adjourned.